Mm. Hi guys, <clears throat> happy homebrew Wednesday. Let's see ya. I'm actually just drinking a Caesar here. Um, reason being, I, uh, I don't have any homebrew <clears throat> at the moment, but I will have very shortly. Um, Caesar is just, um, it's vodka and uh, Clamato juice. Um, that sounds kind of weird. If you've never tried one, you're missing out. Um, Clamato juice is not a clam flavored juice, although that's what it says it is. I don't know what the hell it's made out of, but anyway, it's good. Well, that's what we're doing. Now today, I'm going to be answering some more questions, and while I'm doing that, I'm going to try to get this kegging done. So I'm going to be doing, you know, two things at once. <clears throat> so let's get started. Pardon me. Okay, so I'm going to keg this beer up here, and we've got some questions. Let me see what we've uh, got here. Okay, let's talk about let's talk about star sand for a moment. Okay, it's it's been a burning question for. Um, I'm wearing my lapel mic because there's going to be water running and lots of noise. So at least you guys will be able to hear me. A lot of debate and questioning and all this kind of stuff over the years, or at least over the last couple of years anyway, about star sand and whether it continues to work even after it's cloudy. And unfortunately, uh, the definitive answer has not yet come to surface as far as I'm concerned. Um, I have continued to keep my eye out on this topic, and some people say it works fine. <clears throat> Other people say it doesn't, and there's different reasons given. So I don't know yet. Um, the thing that confuses me is that I've heard two separate interviews on Homebrew Network, like on some podcast networks. Um, two separate interviews from two different people from the stars, from the makers of Star Sand. And uh, yeah, I'm using my bottle washer to wash out my, rinse out my keg here. Be a good idea. And so the first guy said, uh, "Well, yeah, he was all happy-go-lucky. He was like." Hey, you know, if you used star sand and you you cleaned out your keg and you forgot to, you missed a spot, it doesn't matter. Star sand will will get it clean. And it, well, it won't clean it, but it'll it'll sanitize it anyway. It'll just go right over it. You know, he says it's not a problem. It's good stuff, and you can use it for a long time. And even if you miss a spot, it's still good. It still cleans, and everything else. So I thought, hey, you know. He didn't mention anything about it being, uh, be, uh, being uh, you know, uh, foggy or cloudy or anything like that. He said, as long as the pH is below 3.0, you're good. That's all he said. I'm like, perfect. I'm good now. I can reuse it. Doesn't matter if it's cloudy. Great. Oh, a few weeks or months down the road, I heard another interview from a different guy from Star Sand. Now, this guy was a little more about selling their products. Okay, so he's like, well, you know, you can't use star sand until you absolutely are positively sure that your stuff is clean, and it won't sanitize properly if so, if there's something stuck in there that you didn't that you didn't notice, which is opposite to the, what the other guy said. And these are both guys from Star Sand who invented the thing. And um, um, I'm just doing a rough cleaning today, by the way, because for one, I'm out of OxyClean, and for two, I'm putting just about the exact same beer in here as what's coming out. So we're just going to do a quickie um, sanitize here, uh, rinse and sanitize. So yeah, so uh, he, the second guy was like, oh, yeah, you need the PBW, and you got to do this, and the star sand won't work if it's cloudy. Uh, actually, his exact words were, it works if the pH is below 3.0. And it's clear. I'm like, what, what did what did I hear that last part? It has to be clear. Nobody's star sand is clear unless you use distilled water. So generally, I make up a new batch every time I brew or do anything. Um, if it's if it's older than 24 hours, I don't trust it um, because it does go cloudy almost immediately. And if it's older than 24 hours, I just make a new batch. Now, I'm staying on this topic because. Star sand is not that expensive in the U.S., but here it is expensive because I guess they have to ship it across the border. So this container of star sand 
was given to me from somebody in the States, Paul. It was $17.50. This is a 36 ounce bottle. $17.50. This is going to cost me, if I can even get it, this is going to cost me close to 50 bucks. Maybe 40, maybe 40. Okay. This one is the eight ounce bottle. It was $13 for eight ounces. And it looks like I'm, I'm running out, but anyway, I've got a gift certificate. So, um, you know, I try to, I try to conserve it. Now there are a couple things you can do. First thing you can do is, uh, just let me get that on there. If you have a humidifier, sorry, a dehumidifier in your house, you can, you know, clean out the reservoir where the water collects and then use that water, the water that collects in there from the air, uh, to, um, uh, to use for star sand. And it's, it's distilled water. I'm basically going to put this all back together briefly so that I can rinse it out with cold water, with hot water, and then I'm going to sanitize. Okay, so use your dehumidifier water. As long as you're not smoking or spraying all kinds of aerosol or stuff in the house, I guess, I don't know. But pretty much what drips off that condenser is distilled water in your dehumidifier. So, I mean, that's good to go. Now, the other thing you, ha you might want to try is... Uh, um, uh, what is, a, a Brita. Uh, I haven't tried this, but I heard I was reading some forums and I saw somebody mention they use a Brita and their waters, their star sand does not go cloudy anymore because it filters out all the the calciums and whatnot that cause that. So I haven't tried that, but I'm going to. So I will let you know how that works out. Um, I'm going to buy a Brita. Um, if anyone else has done that, if you already have a Brita, and you you can try that for us. Let us know down in the comments section. You might be saving me some money because if I, if it doesn't work, then I'm not going to buy one. Um, you know, basically. So that's that. All right. So I'm just putting these back on, sort of finger tight, and uh, we'll fill her up with hot water. We'll give it her give her a nice rinse out. I'm using iota for tonight because I've got oh, I've got a bunch of it left. Like I've had this for over a year. And I make a new batch every time. This batch is from yesterday and it still looks good to me. As long as it's still brown colored, it's usually fine. And this keg is going straight into a kegerator or refrigerator and it ain't gonna last much longer than a week. So I'm not that worried about infections. Uh, if you were putting in a keg and leaving your beer for longer periods and room temperature, letting it age and whatnot, well, yeah, then you know, you'd absolutely have to be concerned with sanitizing. So I'm using day old iota for I think I should be okay. So let me see what we've got here. What's the next thing? Uh, oh, hop schedules. Somebody asked about hop schedules. Hop schedules, there's as many of those as there are people on this planet. <laughs> so you can't, you can't, that's not an easy answer. <clears throat> that depends on a recipe. Okay. Um, an easy hop schedule, depending on what you're doing, is... You know, you use a bittering hop, a high alpha acid hop, for one hour in a boil. And towards the end of that boil, say 10 minutes, 5 minutes, you use a lower alpha hop for flavor and aroma. Okay? Um, but there's... That's just a basic one. There's so many different hop schedules. Some pe you, and you can go crazy with hop. You can, add a, you can add a different hop every 10 minutes to your boil. An ounce of this, a couple ounces of that, and then a couple, you know, later on, and then you dry hop, and you get like a hop bomb as far as that goes uh, with with that beer. Uh, so I'm gonna quickly go under the rim here. And, uh, so again, very very rough cleaning here today because I'm just putting the same beer in as we had in. Okay, so that's the hop schedule thing. What's next? Um, Sediment in bottles. Okay, so you're carbonating your beer. Some people are very bothered, especially some beginners, I guess, very bothered by having sediment in their beer bottles um, when they're when they're you know carbonating their beer in the bottle. Well, <clears throat> part of the carbonating process in the bottle 
results with, in sediment. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Don't bother with coffee filters. Don't bother with anything. Um, I have those SEDEX, what are these things over here? Uh, <coughs> excuse me, they're buried under there, but they're there. And you, you know, the SEDEX bottle um, sediment reducers. And you can look that, at that video up on my on my channel. They do come from Australia and they're expensive to ship here, so that's the only problem. But they work very well. Um, but no, just, you know, sediment, you're gonna get it. For, forget about it, forget about trying to get rid of it. It's always gonna be there if your beer is carbonated in the bottle. So you have to get over that and stop being afraid of it because you know what? Clear beer is not, is actually less natural than non-clear beer. You know, they filter it at the, the, beer, at the, at the factory when they, where they make the beer. And it's physically, you know, it's, it's visually, aesthetically pleasing to look at. And I have to admit when I pour a clear beer like that, it is. It's, it's like, wow. However, they filter their beers. They've got different procedures than home brewers do. And they don't ferment their, <clears throat> they don't carbonate their beer in the bottle. <clears throat> they pre-carbonate it as it's going in. So they don't have to worry about uh, sediment. The the beer has been killed. It's been you know everything's been the yeast is gone, and they're just force carbonating it as it goes in, <coughs> so they don't have to worry about it. But home brewers, you're going to get sediment. Just pour it gently into a into a glass. Keep your eye on the sediment, and you're going to have to leave about this much beer in the bottom of your bottle. Just all there is. And if you get some sediment in your beer, uh, well, I don't know. Close your eyes. <laughs> Close your eyes and drink it, because it's it's not bad for you. It's not yuck. It's just uh, it's just d dormant yeast, and it won't hurt you. So stop being afraid of it. It's not going to hurt you at all. What's the next question we've got here? Um, oh, briefly last week's subject came up: a fluoride. <clears throat> the reason why I brought that up is because there's been some concern about how about fluoride in the tap water. And um, the fact that it is, is actually, in the white paper, considered a toxic uh, substance. Now, the argument is, of course, that there's not enough of it in our tap water to harm us, just like chlorine. You know, there's not enough chlorine in our tap water to hurt anybody. However, some people has, some people's research concludes that fluoride is accumulative in the body, and that it does a lot of things that aren't good to us. And the reason they put it in the water is because maybe not enough research has been done or maybe they just don't care and they're just trying to get rid of the stuff or they're trying to do something else, who knows, okay? I mean, let's face it, pharmaceuticals love when we're sick because that's when we make money. They, that's when they make money. So that's why I brought it up. But really guys, you know, don't listen to me. You know, do your own, definitely do your own research when it comes to fluoride. Um, and if you don't mind it, then don't, you know, don't worry about it. I don't tend to worry about it too much. I'm aware of the, the controversy over it. A lot of parts in the world don't put fluoride in their water, and some parts of the world have ceased to put fluoride in their water for that very, very reason. That they've been, it's been talked about, the fact that it's, it's not good for human beings. It's bad, and it's, it's accumulative. So a little bit of controversy there. Just, you know, relax and just do your own. If you're concerned about it, do some research on it. If you're not concerned about it, move on, okay? I, I, again, I don't concern myself too much with it, but I do, I am aware of the controversy over it, and that's where I'm gonna leave that one, okay? All right, what's the next one here? Let's get to this here. Um, <coughs> so, Somebody wanted to know, and there was quite a bit of discussion actually over uh, using uh, commercial beer bottles for bottling your beer. And the long and short of it is that you can, now we're talking commercial beer bottles with the threads, okay, so that the twist off bottles, um, you can use them. Some people do use them with no problem. Others, like myself, use them with a problem. Okay, I continually had flat beer 
the bottle caps that you buy and the cappers that you use to put them on are not designed to contour themselves to the threads on the tops of the bottles. Okay, they're they're more made for the. Uh, I guess I don't have one around here. Uh, <coughs> no, I guess I don't. So anyway, you you know what I, you know the non twist off. They're they're made for the non twist off because the crown the crown they're called crown caps. They they go down and then they hug underneath that rim that's at the top of the bottle, the mouth of the bottle. They kind of they they sort of grab it like that and they pull it and that's how they seal. Well, you're crimping onto threads. Um, it's not as smooth of a surface. There's more chance of there being a chip in there, like a chip in the threads. Um, and you, you might not get a good seal. Some people have no problem with it. Other people don't recommend it because they have had problems with it. So the only thing that I can suggest to you is to, um, is to try them. Go get yourself a capper, a bottle capper. There's two types. There's the kind that go like this, and there's a the kind that sit on the floor and you push down the handle. There are usually about 10 to 20 to 30, between 10 and 30 dollars. Usually the handles are red. You'll know one to see one. Okay? They're all over YouTube. You'll be able to find them at your local homebrew supply shop or, you know, just about anywhere that sells homebrew supplies. And, um, you know, do a couple of threaded bottles. S excuse me and see how they work out. If they work for you, Bob's your uncle. Um, if they don't, then, you know, get some of those um, Sam Adams uh, beer bottles and gives you an excuse to buy some good beer. And, uh, you know, accumulate some bottles. Um, I, I personally like the... Uh, and I was just looking for them and I can't seem to find one. Uh, <coughs> here's one. This is probably dirty, but it isn't anyway. You know, these bottles, this is filthy, this hasn't been cleaned in a while. It's been sitting. These uh, flip top bottles. I love these things. This is one liter. Okay, you put three half teaspoons of dextrose in here, or three carbonation drops, if you're using those. You fill it up, you put that on, you snap it, you can do it with one hand while you're filling up one, another bottle with another. They're a little expensive, but it's an investment. They're glass, they wash, they don't have smells, and you'll always ha you'll have them forever as long as they don't blow up, explode somehow, overcarbonating. Okay, so that's that. What's the next one here? We're gonna try to move move along. Uh, oh, stout versus porter question. By the way, guys, I might have missed a few questions, and I'm I apologize if I apologize if I do. Um, I can't answer every single question, and I. Do try to read all the comments. Um, but if I miss your question, it doesn't mean that I don't like you. <laughs> Stouts and porters. I'm going to put a link to a website in the info section down below to that explains to you in much detail about stouts and porters. But for in general, um, stouts are pretty much darker than porters. Stouts use, uh, for the most part, with some exceptions, roasted barley, which was which is a very dark, unmalted barley that which they roast and make it dark. Um, stouts are generally either very very dark brown or black, and have a more bitter taste to them than a porter might. So a porter is like the little brother, let's say. Porters are a little lighter. They tend to be a little bit sweeter and they, they fall into sort of the dark brown category, <clears throat> not the black category. Now there's reasons for the names of them and there's stories behind them and whatnot. And again, that website you can go and read, but that's basically what the main difference is. There is some gray area in between the two, um, stouts and porters. Um, there's some overlap and there's lots of different types of each. And it's really not, again, it's not a definitive <clears throat> Pep Coke, Pepsi Coke thing. It's definitely a wishy-washy area, but in general, stouts are the real dark ones. Porters are a slightly lighter. That's the difference. I'm going to shake this up. I'm going to go and put some CO2 in it so I can rinse my lines, and we're going to get on with kegging this batch of beer and some more questions. I'll be right back. Thank you. 
And we're back. Mm. Okay. Now, I've got this full of uh, iota 4, and I'm going to give it another little shake. It's also pressurized, which is actually something I don't normally do until after I'm done, I'm done shaking it, but I actually had to stop and go make dinner. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to give it another little... Uh, not necessarily a shake, more of us just a roll, just to coat everything in a sanitizer. The reason why I don't want to shake it when it's pressurized is because I'll carbonate the, the sanitizer, which doesn't matter, but then I won't have any pressure left to dispense it through my tubing, right? It's just kind of a little bit of an order to things here. So we just get it, get it going here. Now, with my multitasking here, making this video while I am doing this as I forgot to rinse out my line. So, here's a cheat, okay? This line had a Cooper's IPA with hops, a hop tea added, okay? That's what this had, and I just finished the keg like last night. So, rather than why not just leave it? It's been it's been turned off. It's been sealed. Whatever's in here is part of the last batch, and I've got the exact same batch going into the keg as what was in the keg before. So why even bother sanitizing it this time? I wouldn't do this every time, but you can cheat like that if you're in a hurry and, and or you know, I mean, I could run sanitizer through this and rinse it out, but there's no need. It's it's already sanitized. It's been being used. If this was a 10 gallon keg, what would be the difference, right? Might want to spread some sanitizer on the on this before I put it back on. Boom, all right? So that's what we're not gonna worry about. We'll put this in my little tray. We'll empty the keg that's been sanitized with star, with iota 4 into the tray. And then I'll sanitize the um, inlet and outlet valves separately. Okay, which I already did once, but I will do it again. And while I'm doing that, I will get to the next question. Oh, carbonating wine. Okay, this is, this is a good question. Now, it depends on how you made the wine. If you made wine from a wine kit, where you have the big bag of grape juice, and then you add the, the yeast and the, and that, and then later on you add the potassium and a bisulfite and the clearing, agents, that kind of wine kit, okay? No, you cannot carbonate that in a bottle, okay? This is the line I'm talking about. I'm going to put sanitizer through this line just by dipping it in and letting it run through, okay? So it's, it's not a problem. It's fine. If I was putting a different, completely different batch of beer in here, or if this had sat for a few weeks uh, empty without being cleaned out, of course I would give it a, a full cleaning, but it was just being used. It was just in service two days ago. So, you know, same batch is going in. Um, you can't bottle that kind of wine. You can, I mean, you can bottle it, I'm sorry. You can't carbonate it. For one thing, uh, the regular wine bottles, which I, again, I don't seem to have one kicking around here. Here's one. You, you put the cork in it. These aren't made for carbonation, okay? So the cork's gonna fly right out if you try to carbonate this. Plus the cork, it doesn't allow a perfect seal. So you're gonna get some release and the, the wine won't carbonate properly. You just, it's not made to be, car these bottles aren't made for it. Um, not only, I don't know if they're thick enough or if they'll withstand it, um, but the cork uh, will not stay in. You have bop, 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 corpse flying out all over the place. So you can't. Even if you were to use one of these and seal it properly, okay, you still can't carbonate it because the yeast is dead. You've killed off the yeast with the stabilizers that you added, this potassium metabisorbite, metabisulfite and all that stuff. 
so there's nothing in there to eat the sugar to cause carbonation. So you still can't carbonate it. You could leave those things out and don't, don't kill the yeast. But when you're dealing with a 60, 70, 80 dollar wine kit, I don't know if I'd be messing with it like that. You might end up with, uh, it might not last very long, might not preserve very well. So the only way you can do it though, what you can do is instead of bottling the wine, do it the way you normally do it with all the chemicals and everything. And instead of bottling it, keg the wine and carbonate the wine the way you would beer. And then you've got sparkling wine. Okay, another reason to go out and get a keg. All right, now if you're doing inmate brew or hard apple cider, where you're not actually using stabilizers and whatnot to, to kill the yeast, yeah, then you can, you can put it in bottles and carbonate it just like you would beer. Because there's still live yeast left in there. Okay, but there's not live yeast left in the wine that's been finalized and the potassium metabisulfite and potassium sorbate have killed off uh, killed off any chance of any further fermentation because it's remember it's the fermentation inside the bottle that creates the carbon dioxide that gives it the fizz okay same with beer and again in a wine situation like that you're going to get sediment in the bottle from the in bottle carbon is it carbon carbonation Blech. okay so that's that now i get i better get to this because I'm running out of Caesar and I need a beer. So we're just gonna give these, you can't see what I'm doing, just giving these a final rub here, these parts here. Um, inside the keg has already been sanitized. And um, just take these inlet and outlet valves, give them a dip. And that's that, I can now I can go put this one back in because it's been done already. Okay, so that's some of the answers to those questions. Is there any more here? Okay, somebody asked um, why beer kits come with um, liquid malt extract, dry malt extract, and grains if they all do the same thing. Why have, it, why have all three when just the grains would be enough or just the, just the liquid malt extract would be enough or just the dry malt extract would be enough? Um, First of all, normally when you get a kit like that with a mixture of those things, normally the grains aren't, they're not the fermentable, uh, fermentable base grains usually, uh, like two row, they're specialty grains, uh, like these. Like this is, uh, this is uh, Carafoam, okay? I've got Crystal down there, I've got you know, chocolate malt down there. Those are all specialty grains. They're there for flavor and color. Okay, they're not. Uh, they're not doing anything, or they're doing. They're, they're doing very little, theoretically. Let's not. Let's let's be real here. They're being doing virtually nothing towards fermentation, but they're doing a lot towards uh, the flavor and the color of the beer. So those are for flavor and color, okay? Of course, the liquid malt extract is basically your, your two-row, it's your base, it's your main stuff, your main fermentable, um, that's the bulk of your beer. The dry malt extract is usually um, a, a, a supplement to the liquid malt extract. And the reason why they do that is because the liquid malt extracts are, are generally um, packaged in certain amounts like for instance uh, uh, let me see where have I got one here just let's see I've got one this here this is a uh, what are what are these 1.7 kilograms okay so you know these are 1.7 kilograms uh, other uh, manufacturers may use different sort of you know measurements that they put them in the plastic containers I've seen them come uh, with um, larger plastic containers of liquid malt extract and then they'll send you a smaller like a half size one because that's how much liquid extract or, or extract they want you to use um, but some companies you know they'll send you a can of muntins or whatever brand of liquid malt extract but they want you to add a little bit more so they'll send a little bag of dry malt extract and that's that that amounts to the, what they want you to use uh, in the batch 
Okay, that's my best guess. Liquid malt extract, dry malt extract do the same thing. Yes, they do. They're, they're absolutely identical, except the dry malt extract has a longer shelf life, much longer than the liquid malt extract does. But not to worry. I mean, I've never had a problem with either of them. Okay, so that's all done. Keg is prepared. Now I'm just going to sanitize my siphon. These, these have all been cleaned and stuff, so we'll get our other half. I think that's about it. Um, what other questions? I think that was it. Well, the most important thing I think is that it was my birthday this past weekend. And um, I had a lot of Facebook uh, contacts or, you know, messages saying happy birthday. And thank you guys. There was a ton of them. I, I took me a while to go through them all, but I did, I did see them all. And I did look at the names. Thank you very, very much. That was really nice. Um, I really appreciate that um, for all you guys who, who did that. And if you didn't, that's fine too, because I had there was enough there. Uh, it's okay. So thank you so much. I, that's very, uh, very warm heart, warm heart, heartwarming to know that people are are thinking about you, even though they don't know you personally. Um, and my mom, my mom actually. Uh, I'll tell you what. Just one sec. So we went to my mom's house on my birthday, uh, and uh, we had a beautiful Chinese food dinner. Uh, she made it herself. I forgot how much good of a cook my mom is, really. I mean, this was a, a shrimp stir fry with noodles in it, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, it was just beautiful. And then she had uh, fried rice, which was better than the bland, bloody stuff you get at the Chinese food stores, really. So we had a beautiful dinner, a couple glasses of red wine, uh, me and my boys. My wife couldn't go. She was sick. So I didn't want her to give my mom sickness. My mom's 75 years old, so we don't want her getting sick too easily. And um, then we went in the hot tub and we sat and we talked out, out in the, out the dark in the, under the stars about all kinds of stuff. We just talked about all kinds of stuff. You know, it was really cool and nice, warm and cozy and just a great time. So that's what we did on my birthday. It was a great day. I came home, had a couple Caesars, a couple beers. And then I went to bed. So it was cool and uh, had a great time. And my mom bought me, I'll just show you a second when I get this roll in here. This is where we, this is where we're at, the action happens, baby. Let's get this opened up. Oh, it smells good. <laughs> we're all set. Let's get this rinsed out a little here. Sanitizer out of there. Drop that down into there. So I don't use spigots anymore. I don't like to clean them. Drop that down into the old keg. Bob's your uncle. Now, my mom also uh, she bought me some beer. Um, I don't know a lot about all the some of these beers, but she bought. I'll just tell you what they are. This is a, uh, a Stella Arteos. Is that how you? Anyway, you can see that. And then she bought me a, a Rickards Red. Boom. And when you can hear it splashing around like that, you got to move that around. You don't want to hear that because it means it's... She bought me a Rickards Dark. Whoops. She bought me a Rolling Rock IPA. Extra IPA. It was good. Am I on camera? Yeah, it was it was good. That was a, I really enjoyed that one. And then she bought me a uh, <coughs> Alexander Keith's India Pale Ale. Very refreshing. And uh, well, they're also gone. So there you go. That's what we've got there. So that's pretty much it. Um, I think I'm done. I don't know how long this video is going to be, but that's what we've got. So I managed to to do that keg that while I was doing my questions. That's how easy kegging is. It's very, very simple. You do it off, you know, you do it in your sleep with one hand tied by in your back. It's basically that easy once you get used to it. And uh, there's no problem. And we did it in, well, less than half an hour. Again, I don't know how long this video ended up. And there's probably some editing too. So, but anyways, I'm out. Thank you very much, guys, for sticking around, for watching. Thank you for your patronage over the years, for keeping on watching my stuff and uh, your comments and your, your suggestions, your, your, uh, your um, 
kind words. Mm. Caesars. I love them. I do. I got no, no beer to, to cheers you out with, but anyways, cheers out, and we'll see you soon. Cast, my broadcast, Friday night, 10 p.m. Eastern Time. People still ask how to get there. That's how you do it. Friday night, Eastern Standard Time, justin.tv slash craigtube. See ya.